Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guests are Michelle Broadnax, President and CEO of the Los Angeles Education Partnership, Lynette Guastafero, CEO of Teaching Matters in New York, and Bita Nazarian, 826 of Valencia in San Francisco. And thank you so much for joining us, panel, and a reminder to our Zoom attendees, we will take three snap polls during the show and we'll announce results. And questions submitted through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. It's so wonderful to, to have you all here from all parts of the United States. You all work so hard to eliminate disparities in education for our children. So let's, let's have an overview of what you do and how you see this challenge uh, to our children so that they can actually be the people that they promise their parents to be. Michelle, uh, why don't we start with you in Los Angeles? Sure, good morning. Um, so just my name again is Michelle Brodnax. I'm the president and CEO of the Los Angeles Education Partnership. LAEP is a diapers to diploma uh, organization where we work in high needs neighborhoods with families. Uh, students, schools, communities as a whole to support um, mostly children who are in high poverty areas um, in their education journey. So we believe that parents are, are the first teachers. We have an early education division. And um, through that, we have a pre-K through 12 division. We call that Transform Schools, um, where we work on <clears throat> excuse me, college and career work uh, at the high end, 12th grade. And in the early grades, we work with teachers specifically and teaching and learning work as well as um, community schools, which is a, a, most folks know community schools as a method to bring resources and the community together to support school needs and to make sure that schools are the hub that, that the communities um, certainly deserve and uh, require in order to serve um, both the families and the students well. So that is a very high level overview of our work, um, just to give time to my fellow panelists as well. And I believe our, our particular focus at this point, um, as we, you know, kind of settle into what it's meaning to be a distance learning uh, organization and kind of supporting schools during this time is really the digital divide. It's the black and brown communities that don't have access to um, computers and or the internet access um, if they do happen to have hardware to um, be able to log in and learn remotely during this time. So that's a big focus of our work, our teaching and learning work, as well as our community school coordinators, their work. Um, during this moment where we know that LAUSD, which is one of the, the, the districts that we serve, it will be distance learning, um, particularly this, probably the, we know for sure the first uh, few weeks of, of the, the school year. Um, so, so that's a, a particular focus that we're supporting our, our students and families on at this time. And we know that it's a huge issue, um, obviously with black and brown communities with the digital divide. I love the characterization of diapers to diploma because one of the things that, that you all deal with is the fact that uh, parents who are financially challenged, who live with need, they have to measure how they balance their investment. They have a responsibility to their children to be working and to earning an income. And they also have a responsibility to their children to be their first educators and to ensure that they have a, a great education. Lynette, you, uh, your organization takes a, a complementary but different cut on this problem than Michelle's. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how you view uh, this problem so that you are helping uh, parents and children to go through the education system and equal that uh, or, or uh, somehow balance out those disparities. So, um, so we like, uh, like Michelle spoke to uh, target communities, which we believe are inequitably served by the education system um, for, for many reasons. And our focus is very specifically around teacher development in our highest needs communities. Our view is that every child, no matter what zip code they're born in, should have equitable access to great teaching. 
And um, there are many reasons why underserved communities struggle with um, kind of teacher quality and teacher effectiveness. Uh, from the perspective of the pandemic, I want to echo exactly what, uh, you know, what Michelle spoke to is our communities um, were sharing. So New York did a lot of work to provide cable and computers and really um, I want to applaud that work, but it was a huge job. And we know we had lots of kids that fell through the cracks. We had families with four kids sharing one computer. So this access issue was real. And uh, the other issue, I think, from our perspective, which was teachers, was so our view is that last year or this spring, every teacher became a first-year teacher again because they had to uh, learn not only how to teach remotely, but they had to create um, curriculum that could be delivered remotely and create digital curricula. And so we asked ourselves, you know, what can we do for teachers right now just to less lighten the load as they're getting their uh, kind of getting their, their sort of their stance with this new way of teaching, which is going to take time. And so we built out a K to eight curriculum. Um, my team of 50 just started turning it, turning it around and, and distributing it week by week. And it went viral and we had about a hundred thousand teachers using this, this, this curriculum in those early days when they were just sort of, you know, kind of slammed with having to kind of shift into this new environment. So we really, we take this tact of how can we strengthen teachers that are often in under-resourced uh, schools and that are, don't get, often are not getting the same kinds of opportunities as other teachers um, in terms of the supports that, that, that come during their school or supports they've received before they even enter into the profession. And part of our challenge here is how uh, schools are funded. We're, we're very often funded through property taxes, which means that wealthy neighborhoods where tax revenues are high in proportion to the number of people are going to have a, 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 uh, an advantage. So advantage ends up building upon advantage as opposed to trying to even the playing field. Our system automatically tilts and then tilts more and tilts more and tilts more. So this sort of uh, effort by each of you and by your school districts to try and equalize so that every child gets the same opportunity is, is so important. Bita, could you talk a little bit about the efforts of the 826 movement? Yeah, um, thanks for having me. Uh, when I think about the disparities in education, I think um, most specifically about my role as a classroom teacher. I was an eighth grade English teacher for about 10 years. And what I saw in my classroom, 30 kids per class, um, a huge range of talents, and um, the vast majority academically behind in their reading and writing. Um, and so what I love about 826 Valencia is when they came to me as a classroom teacher, they said, how can we help you, classroom teacher, and what do your kids need? And what that looked like was bringing in uh, volunteers who provided one-on-one -on -one attention for our students with their writing. We all know how hard writing is, um, and the support required for students to be stronger writers is really individualized. Like, does a child need help organizing their ideas? Do they need help brainstorming at the very beginning? What does this support look like as students go through the writing process? And 826 Valencia trains volunteers to provide that support for young people. So even as they're learning English as a second language, or they might have um, learning disabilities, they have a volunteer coach who sits side by side with the child and encourages them to keep writing and tells them that their voice matters. We also publish our students um, in books, on podcasts, on coffee sleeves, on billboards for bus stops. And the whole notion of publishing is around elevating student voice for a broader public. And, and really it does two things. One, students will um, have that sense of incredible pride that they can write, they are writers, right? When they see their works published, but also for the broader community to elevate voices that are diverse young people, young people of color, young people whose families are low income, are the voices that we don't see in our dominant lexicon, right? Our dominant narrative of the society. So when we bring those voices up, there's actually a greater 
opportunity for empathy building and understanding. So that's, that's what A26 Valencia does broadly. During, during the pandemic, we saw a lot of the things that my colleagues here talked about, like uh, these disparities exacerbated and amplified by things like the digital divide or families that got sick because we know disproportionately our families are getting sick from this this disease. Uh, you have also the second disease of racism that has, right? All these things are hitting the families we serve um, at disproportionate rates. And so uh, what we try to do is actually partner with teachers and families and be a bridge so that each child that we served and each teacher that we served had access to learning. And, and that's what we spent our time doing. I love this idea of giving voice and creating interactivity between the, the young people of, of different backgrounds and a wider audience. I mean, it's a very modern concept. We're not in Victorian times where little children should be seen and not heard. We're at a point where we want to give voice. And incidentally, we just uh, completed our first poll. And it's very interesting. We asked whether uh, people would send their children back to a traditional in-person uh, classroom setting. And 91% uh, said either no, or only if there were um, real masking, disinfecting, and social distancing protocols set up in schools. Um, it's a very interesting um, idea of how do we get education provided, but in a way that, that also keeps society safe. And there seems to be a, a real consensus about this. I have a question for you all. You're on the front lines of trying to um, address these disparities. And we all agree that these disparities exist, right? Mm -hmm. They primarily affect communities of color and primarily go along income lines, right? Isn't this just a matter of us not investing in kids as a country? Isn't, isn't that, that what we're doing? Because in many respects, your work is basically investing more in those children that you affect. And isn't is because people sometimes say, oh, the public school systems are broken and so on. Isn't this just a matter? And yes, there are stories in which public schools do a poor job or or this school or, or a private school does a poor job, right? There are all those individual stories. But aren't we as a country just not investing in our children um, if they can't, if their parents can't invest themselves? Michelle, what do you think? I think that the country is is maybe failing to invest in black and brown children, children of color um, as a whole. I, I wouldn't necessarily agree that, um, that, that the failure of investment is happening across the board with all children. I think what that is what the achievement gap and these disparities are all about is the fact that a system was built and devised to only serve a select group of children. So I think that, you know, ultimately what we start to look at as a country is the economic impact long term of, of only serving a select um, portion of society. And, and I think ultimately what, what I am here to do and what my organization is here to do is to, to correct that, right? And to work ourselves as an organization out of a job. We wanna make sure that students uh, across the country um, are, are receiving, all students are receiving an equitable education and access and opportunity that serves um, them and their families and ultimately allows them to be great citizens um, and, and contributors. And I think that is I, the job that our, our organization is working to um, solve and work towards, so. Is it really uh, the, the community's responsibility to invest in children whose parents do not have the means? Is that our responsibility? Isn't that just income redistribution? I'd like to echo what Michelle said, is we have a, we're, we're one of the few countries whose entire education system is premised on um, home ownership. And if we think about the history of redlining in this country, we have funded our education system primarily on a, on, a, on a source of income that was systematically denied to families of color for years. And so it's compounded uh, sort of this first incredible wrong that prevented families of color building equity. And now it's built an education system on top of that. So the, the, the level of pro, and, and 
And by the way, I do think we underinvest in our children across the board. I think fam rural white families uh, have experienced serious underinvestment, but the experience of families of color where this has been done on top of redlining is, is why this is so profoundly, um, uh, this is such a profound disinvestment in our kids of color, in, 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 especially in our urban communities. Yeah, I, I agree with my colleagues. I do think it's um, a disproportionate lack of investment in uh, black and brown children and indigenous children. Um, and it's this multi-layered wrongs of historic oppression and racism that show up and are um, multiplied by our education system. I also think broadly we don't invest in um, the teaching profession the way that we do at other professions. Like I, I often imagine a world, what if, what if teaching was as revered as becoming a doctor and lawyer and you could earn those kinds of salaries what would be the talent that we would attract into that profession that spends between, you know, about seven hours a day with our young people. So I, I agree that these are um, issues upon issues that, but broadly our society does not uh, seem to value teaching the way other, other cultures might. And I think that has a, an effect on our young people as well. And to me, you know, to the question of is this, redistribution of wealth. I think for me, education is like a key to our democracy. If we truly believe in democracy, we need a population that is educated and thoughtful and make, able to make decisions and engage civically. So, you know, I think what's coming to head is how does democracy and capitalism, how do these two ideas kind of like mm -hmm. butt heads in our society and um, I, I would love to see greater investment in our schools and teaching. I think these terms are so interestingly uh, weighted, right? In order to encourage certain responses and discourage others. Is it income redistribution? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and where should we invest? Where should we redistribute our, our income? We should redistribute our income to favor children who are the future of the community and the future of the country. Absolutely, it's recovery. I, I should be spending money to help your child, Lynette. I should be spending money to help your child, Michelle or Bita. Why? Because those children are going to be our future. And that's, I mean, yes, it's income redistribution. Terrific. Let's do it. Let's, let, let's jump in. And let's, let's look at, at teachers. Let's look at this profession that, that spends so much time with parents and children and, and cultivates our future. Let's do that. How do you interact with your uh, government and school officials to create an environment that helps children in, in, in a collaboration? Because you can't do everything and you have partner organizations, other nonprofits, you have teachers, how does that work? Uh, Lynette, you want to take a cut at that as to how you interact uh, individually to ensure that, that your limited means are going to where they can have their best impact? So we, we have strong partnerships at sort of the Central Department of Education and even at the, at, you know, at the union level. So for example, when we designed this response for teachers who we felt were going to be overwhelmed by this shift into remote, it was listed by the local unions as a number one resource. The, the principal's union sent it out to everybody. So we've always maintained um, strong partnerships. Not that we can't agree to disagree sometimes and have critical conversations, but if you're in an ecosystem, you have to work with all of the groups together, find common ground, and, and put your best foot forward. And I think that, that that's got to be the way that we approach it. I think sometimes in education, we get into camps and we start to have food fights and you know, every now and then you need to have a tough conversation in the family, but I, I do believe that, that most people in this work are trying to do the right thing and that we've got to find where we can find ground and ground, we can help each other. And so I feel that a lot of it is, a lot of the work of partnerships and being successful of that is really owning where can I, wh what can I do and where can my partners be of help and then always pitching in as a, as a system player um, to not get territorial and turfy, which is which 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 we know our ecosystem can really do. <laughs> uh, 
And and Bita, how, how do you um, end up negotiating for for how these resources are going to be spent, so that everybody gets um, look your whatever decision you make, somebody is going to get a resource and somebody else isn't. How do yeah. you deal with that? How do you navigate? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, what we find is that people get it in San Francisco. They, um, there's a, a huge demand for our resources um, because right, every child would love more one-on-one -on -one attention for their students with their writing and see their kid published. Um, and so that we're just very clear, like we are, in the uh, a nonprofit that serves students who would otherwise not have access to the kinds of resources that we uh, provide. And so a lot of times we are seeking school and teacher partners who serve the kids that we are interested in providing free services for. Um, and as far as parents who come to us, we just like explain that um, that this is the mission of the organization and people tend to get it. Um, and, and I think, you know, San Francisco is a, a more progressive and liberal city and politically in general. Um, and, you know, there's very few people who don't understand why we should be doing what we're doing with the communities that we're serving. It's harder with principals. The principals will compete, right? Because we have a high degree of principals who want our service. With them, it's harder to say, like, you know, I can't serve this, like, enormous amount of schools yet, although we're working on it. We're working on continuing to serve more children in the city, but it's harder to kind of say why we can go with one school and not another with principals who have equal needs for the supports for their kids. Michelle, I'm going to go where angels fear to tread. You know, there's, there's this discussion in this country about um, uh, voucher systems or other systems that allow parents to determine how uh, how their investment in taxes are used. How do you, um, how do you deal with, uh, with that uh, issue? Um, and, and how do you uh, ensure that uh, parents and teachers and school systems um, have a balance between um, individual choice and a completely idiosyncratic system in which there's no organizing principle at all. Oh, that's a, you're right. That's a, that's a very big question. Um, I, I have to say at LAEP, we really don't um, intentionally uh, lean in one direction or another. We believe in a fair and open um, public education system and, and that's what we support. Uh, I think that one of the things that happens really typically um, when we're, we're talking about um, underserved communities as, is that we have the tendency to politicize things that maybe shouldn't necessarily be politicized. And I think that when we're talking about well-educated children and teachers who are supported and school environments that are conducive to learning and are hubs for the communities. I think that is our work and that's where we focus our attention. And we let the, the education policy organizations battle out what's happening in terms of voucher systems. I think that our place and our lane is to really um, build up and edify public education spaces. And that's what we do as an organization. Um, I, I will let my, my colleagues, you know, kind of lean in a little bit more to those political discussions. But I think that for, for LAEP, our work is to really create that um, school site ecosystem that's conducive to learning um, in, in a public school setting. And, and that's kind of where we land as an organization. I, I applaud that, that, that not getting drawn in Mm -hmm. Right to, to to these unproductive discussions, I think that there is no correct answer to some of these questions. That, that there's going to be debate, and each community, each individual, each school district is going to find their own answers. Um, one of the questions that I wanted to uh, ask Lynette came in about um, the child care uh, needs of teachers uh, themselves, because. So many teachers uh, have their own responsibilities. And of course, if they're in the classroom for such a long time during the day, how does that function? Well, I mean, there's pre-pandemic where we 
we really don't have na we don't have a strong national child care policy in this country. So we already started in a hole, and now in the pandemic, we're in kind of a kind of a whole next wave because people make their so people have made their peace or they struggle with childcare as is just the natural you know kind of situation. But in the pandemic now, we have many teachers, school leaders who are now who had uh, who are having many unexpected childcare expenses like things that they. You know, they thought they were done paying for childcare and now their kids were in school. Well, we have some teachers that are going to be in schools that are opened and their kids may be in schools that are, are not opened or their kids are going to be in school one day and they're going to be in schools three days. So that childcare issue right now, I don't have an answer for it because I'm in conversations with teachers that are literally putting their hands in the air saying, I don't know what I'm going to do next year. Maybe I just won't go to school. And that's what, and they're in the process of, of, um, trying to negotiate some of that with, with, with the school system. I, there, this, we're in this place right now where there are more questions than answers to some of these really, really mm -hmm. tough issues, frankly. And I'm curious, you know, I, I don't know how it's gonna play out. And how do you find uh, this in San Francisco, Vita? Yeah, I mean, I think what we find, um, I, I don't know how the child care system's working for teachers. I think that it, we're all struggling, all of us, including this executive director, how you work <laughs> and um, be in meetings all day and care for your children and be their teacher, which is gonna start in a couple of weeks for me. Um, so I, I can only imagine how, that, how hard that is for our teachers who are parents. Um, but I think that what we're seeing when we talk with our teachers more broadly is this like, all the learning that they have to do around these new educational tools. Um, and secondly, a very deep concern for uh, the fact that not all our students are showing up in their classrooms. Those are the two primary things that we hear from our teacher partners. I haven't heard as much about the challenges of um, childcare during this time from them. So it's interesting. We just took uh, two other polls. Um, uh, one is, uh, uh, this this uh, this poll of education and safety. Um, it was interesting. Sixty five percent of the individuals responding said that parents and teachers individually must determine the balance for their uh, children, classrooms, and for themselves. So there's a whole reliance on the individual judgment of the teachers and of the parents who are who are affected. Uh, there was also a split where uh, districts should determine, uh, but. Uh, um, there was nobody who said that only in-person instruction to traditional classroom settings was the answer for this pandemic time. So this idea of we're all going to just instantaneously switch back to normal, uh, that does not seem to be embraced at all in this poll. And then the other uh, interesting uh, response was we, we talked about uh, whether the future of education will have uh, massive change, uh, some change, minor change, or no change. And fully 95% believe that there will be some change that sustains beyond the pandemic. And 50%, the largest group of respondents, thinks that think there will be fundamental change. Are you finding, are you all finding that reflected in your own views and the views of your staff? Absolutely. I think that one of the things that I've been saying to to my staff is that if if we as an organization don't take advantage of this disruption in order to transform um, public education for our students and particularly students of color, then then we've wasted a lot of you know time and an unfortunate circumstance, but an opportunity nonetheless to make a difference in, in the lives of, of children and families. I think that ultimately, you know, change for, for those of us who are into transforming education and making it better for all students, um, what we would like to see is, is um, some sort of learning model or some sort of adaptation that allows for um, to close the achievement gap, obviously, and to create um, access and opportunity for students that maybe didn't have it pre-pandemic. Um, what that looks like, I agree with my, my colleague Lynette, we have more questions than answers at this time, but I do believe that 
this is the kind of, of disruption that we were um, not hoping for. Certainly nobody was hoping for a pandemic, but certainly knowing that this level of disruption was required in order to facilitate the kind of change that we all have been working for for years. Well, the response of you, Michelle, and your staff at the Los Angeles Education Partnership, Lynette Guestafero um, of Teaching Matters in New, in New York, thank you so much for your work and for the work of your staff and your board, and Bita Nazarian of 826 Valencia in San Francisco. This is a really important discussion, and your work, your work, your staff's work, your partner's work in schools is the most important work that we have in the United States. So thank you so much. That's the nonprofit report. Uh, attendees, thank you so much for coming, for your questions, for your answers to polls, and we'll see you uh, on Thursday.